we are continuing a series of sermons that we're doing on the book of Revelation, where we're going through the book just piece at a time together as a church, uh, which this morning has us looking at the fourth letter of seven that you find near the beginning of Revelation, which are these letters that were written by the resurrected Jesus through his follower John to these seven churches that were around back then in the first century, around 90 AD when this was written. And the letter we're looking at today was written from Jesus to a church in a city called Thyatira, which is a very interesting place, if you're a history buff especially here, we'll throw it on the screen. Um, it didn't have that exciting of a founding. It was founded originally as a military outpost by Seleucus I. But by the time this letter was written that we're gonna read, here's the deal. It had become this economic hub for a lot of trade guilds. Now what's a trade guild? Well, kind of like a union, if any of you are part of a union, but not entirely. It was these different groups of traders back then. Um, in fact, records we have from the first century tell us that there were more trade guilds in Thyatira than any other Asian city at the time. They had a guild for almost every trade. And most of the people who were involved in any kind of financial activity was involved in one, uh, one guild or another. They belonged to them as a member, which actually was part of the problem for the church in Thyatira because, see, each of those guilds also had a patron pagan god associated with them. And uh, when the guilds would get together for their official meetings, it wasn't just about business. Uh, part of those meetings was this festive time of paying homage to these false gods, these pagan gods, which also usually involved doing some stuff that God would say is out of bounds for his people. And so if you didn't participate in those meetings, though, you'd basically be ostracized financially. So imagine trying to be a Christian, here's your first fill in there, in a place like Thyatira and trying to follow Jesus, knowing Jesus commands you to worship him and only him, right? Only Yahweh God, that's it. But you're also just trying to make a living, right? As part of one of these guilds. So what do you do when it's guild time? And your allegiance to Jesus says, business meeting's fine, but the worship part, not cool. But the guild guys expect you to join them in their worship and deny Jesus, or they'll kick you out. Or let's make it more real for today. What do you do today when the job you work at, where you're just trying to make a living, in some way asks you to do something dishonoring to Jesus? Because it always is gonna happen to all of us at some point, right? In some way, somehow, your job, your coworkers, make it clear, subtly, if, if not otherwise, that you know, if you keep following Jesus, we're not gonna invite you to hang out with us. It could hurt your chances at a promotion. It could hurt, who, who knows what else? He could, you could lose your job in the first place, right? Have you been there? Let's see what these Christians did in their circumstances, which were basically the same thing back in 90 AD, only possibly a little worse, and see what we can learn from what Jesus says here. So Revelation 2, starting in verse 18, here is what Jesus says. Check it out there. He says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, that you're now doing more than you did at first. Awesome. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I'll strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, now what on earth does all that mean? Let's take it one part at a time. So first, back to verse 18. Jesus starts off similar to how he does in the other letters, right? He, he lets them know who this letter is from. It's not just from the Apostle John. It's not some guy down the street's opinion. These are the words of the resurrected Son of God himself, whose eyes, he says, are like blazing fire and whose feet 
are like burnished bronze. You might remember Revelation 1. One describes them that way too when John sees them. And those are extremely important symbols for this church he's writing to, and we'll talk about why. But really quick, this idea that Jesus' eyes are like blazing fire, it's actually a metaphor for judgment, right? Judgment. And, and his having feet like burnished bronze is this idea of his moral purity, the same purity he wants his followers to have, even when you live in a place that's surrounded by stuff trying to pull you away from Jesus, stuff that's morally wicked and evil. So the way Jesus introduces himself in this letter is this powerful reminder, okay, of who it is it's writing. It's from the Son of God who is the perfect judge of the world and wants his followers to reflect his purity to the people around them. Make sense? That's simple. He's the per Son of God, perfect judge of the world who wants his followers to reflect the same kind of moral purity he has. So listen carefully to what he's about to say, right? Then he says to this church, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. In other words, he is totally aware of everything that had been happening to this church. If you ever feel like God doesn't know what's going on in your life or your job or your whatever, it's not true. He knows everything. He's totally aware. And in his opinion, this church, as that perfect judge, his opinion was, you guys are doing great in love, in faith. You guys aren't just like doing you know, general Christian stuff. I mean, they're persevering, persevering and sharing Jesus with the people around them. They hadn't been this group that started out strong in their faith and then fizzled out over time. They were increasingly doing what Jesus wanted them to do, being that witness for him, striving to make disciples. And Jesus starts making it clear, starts out by making it clear. He is very, very pleased with that. It's like right on. Nevertheless, he goes on in verse 20. I do, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed idols. What on earth? Who is Jezebel? Well, as we keep saying, if you want to decode Revelation, what do you use? Anyone? Bonus point? The Old Testament, right? Don't use a conspiracy theory website, a weird cult down the street. You know, watch the news track. It's very simple. You decode it with the Old Testament. And if you read Old Testament books, we're going to come up to eventually in the challenge, like First and Second Kings. One person you read about is a woman named Jezebel, who was married to a king of Israel named Ahab, who ruled from about 874 to 853 B.C. Welcome, guys. Come on in. We have some spots right back there for you. Um, 874 to 853 B.C. And Jezebel, you discover, as you keep reading in the book of Kings, was not a hero of the Bible, okay? Bible has villains too, not just the devil. Jezebel was actually infamous for something she did. She got the king Ahab and Israel to worship this false man-made idol called Baal. Here is what Baal looked like too. This is what people would worship. Instead of the God who spoke everything into existence, they worshiped this little statue. And they would even burn their children to things like this as part of worship, okay? And basically Jezebel led Israel to compromise their devotion to God to cheat on God, like we've talked about before, spiritually, right? And worship that thing instead, okay? Which is a really big deal when over and over and over, Yahweh God says things like this, like we've talked about, right? He says, you fear the Lord your God and serve him only. Take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Wow, he's very serious about worshiping only him. But we can understand that, right? If you're married and your spouse comes to you one day and goes, you know, I kind of dig you, but I'm gonna go cheat on you for a while. Is that cool? I mean, how many of us would be okay with that? Of course it's not okay. And basically God's saying, if you worship other things than him, you're, you're cheating on him spiritually. And he's not cool with that. And it's the ultimate big deal when the person you cheat on is God. So understand, Jezebel is not one of the heroes of the Old Testament. What she did was bad. And when Jesus uses her name here as a symbol, here's your next fill in there, he's using her name symbolically to refer to maybe a person or maybe a group of people in this church in 90 AD in Thyatira who were teaching people things that were causing them to compromise their faith in Jesus their faith in God, and to join with the paganism in their society like Jezebel did in the Old Testament. Now, can you see why that would be a temptation? I live in this culture where if I'm just going to make it financially, I have to be a part of these meetings, and these meetings aren't just business. They want me to worship their gods, but i got to follow Jesus who says not to. And so there's this group that comes in and goes, oh, okay, you know, I know you're all worried about this Jesus versus the business thing. 
and how you can follow Jesus and make a living keeping your morals when making a living here requires you to disobey Jesus. These guys would say, don't worry about it, though. If you want to take part in a pagan celebration to some other god, do it. It's no big deal. What else are you going to do? Starve to death? You know what you're going to do? Not make money? You just quit your job? Leave? I mean, because you want to follow Jesus in a place where people who don't believe what you do don't do that too? Come on. Besides, and here's the kind of stuff they do. Besides, doesn't the Bible say Christians should follow the law of the land? Right? Doesn't the Bible say give Caesar what Caesar's? Didn't Paul write, we know idols aren't really gods? And now he's so come on, isn't your faith strong enough to handle this? That was the idea. And on and on, the scripture twisting and the half-truths went from this group in the church. And should you get concerned because of what we talked about last time, that, you know, wait a second, though, worshiping other gods, the Bible says that's like worshiping Satan. That's taking part in demons. Well, the false teachers had an answer for that, too. Oh, come on. There was apparently this secret knowledge they promised people. Right? So don't worry about it. And, hey, if you hang out with us, we'll even give you some secret knowledge about God. Stick with us. We have this deep thing that no one else knows, and it apparently had something to do with the idea that you could participate with demon stuff, and it wouldn't harm you as a Christian. It's fine. That's the idea. But guess how much of that was actually true from Jesus' perspective, right? Based on this letter. Yet how many people today, even in America, how many of us fall for the same exact lie these guys were speeding this church, right? I mean, how many Christians do you know that read books where the hero is a witch or a sorcerer? Read books, watch TV shows, Supernatural, Lucifer, and they think, oh, it doesn't matter. Can I tell you this letter makes clear? It does, actually. You are playing with demonic stuff, and you don't want to give Satan that foothold in your life or open that door even a little bit. Dabbling with Ouija boards, contacting the bed. There, there's these, like, you know, goddess parties people have in this area. All that stuff, God says, stay away from it. It's not harmless fun. You're messing with demons, and it's not a thing to do, right? And, and you'll hear people, well, I'm going to go to my friend's seance party. Are you kidding me? Are you, are you following Jesus? None of that's okay. There's no version of spiritual compromise that's okay with God. If you get nothing else out of today, get that. That's what Jesus is saying. And there's no secret knowledge apart from God either, by the way. Can, can we get that out of this passage? I hope we know that. If you didn't before, I hope you listen to what Jesus himself is saying. If anyone ever comes to you, I have some secret knowledge from outside the Bible. They're lying. It's from Satan. Jesus makes it clear right here. No, everything you need to know, he already told you within the Bible. Anything outside is a trick from Satan. Look at what Colossians says here. Colossians says, see to it no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Look at this, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Here is a big verse. For in Christ, look at this, all. If you write in your Bible, go to that verse, circle, underline, highlight. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. There is no secret teaching. He's not holding out on you. It's not like, well, the Bible has most of it, but this group says they have more. So the, none of that stuff. Jesus says, all you need to know is in him as recorded in scripture. Everything you need spiritually is within scripture as he's revealed himself. You don't need some other prophet. You don't need some angelic power. You don't need golden plates from, you know, a cave. You don't need a secret handshake that gets you into a secret club. None of that stuff, okay? All you need is Jesus according to Jesus himself. He says right here, that secret knowledge stuff, that's not how I work. So if you think you're getting secret knowledge from God somewhere, you're tricked because that's not how I do things. Yeah, but this group over here says their stuff's based on the Bible, Pastor Matt. Don't they all? You know how many cults I can name that claim that something from the Bible is what started them? Please. How about we listen to the guy that wrote the Bible, <laughs> Jesus himself, and stick like he says where there's no compromise. He obviously means it. Look what he says next in verse 21. You remember how he started out? I am the perfect judge, and I want you to reflect my purity. Verse 21, as far as the group that was teaching this stuff, he says, I gave, her, I gave her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I'll cast her on a bed of suffering, and I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I'll repay each of you according to your deeds. Okay, it's all symbolic, right? But here's the point. In other words, Jesus says, I gave these false teachers time to stop what they were doing. We don't know the specifics of it. They had a chance, and I gave the people following them a chance to change, 
and no one did. So, Jesus says, here's the next one, there is some major judgment coming their way with eternal consequences. This is a big deal to Jesus. And notice something about this too. It wasn't just the false teachers he was gonna judge. It was the people following them too. Jesus makes it clear. Every one of us has our own responsibility to know the truth. On Judgment Day, we can't say, well, I didn't know, Lord, they tricked me. He's like, you have a responsibility to study this for yourself, to know the truth for yourself so you don't get led astray by false teaching. The Bible says that in tons of books in the New Testament. Know the truth. Watch out for false teachers. Get into the Bible for yourself. Make sure Pastor Matt's not off his rocker when he says stuff on Sunday morning. Make it, check it out for yourself. We don't get to blame anyone else if we fall for it. He says, I'm holding you responsible. I'm bringing punishment on the teachers and the followers, which is even going to involve their death in this case. Whoa. He's serious, just like the punishment was for Jezebel in the Old Testament, by the way. And this judgment Jesus is bringing is so big, he says, notice, all the other churches are going to know about it. Wow. I mean, it's not just, well, it'll just be in this little ice. No, he's like, I'm going to make it all the churches are going to know about this. And they're going to understand from it that Jesus is the judge he says he is. He's not messing around. Okay, he is the perfect judge. That's that idea of he who searches hearts and minds there. It's this idea that Jesus' knowledge pierces to the core of our being. You know, we might be able to fool someone else externally. We might be able to fool ourselves. False teachers might be able to hide their motives from us. But God sees everything, which is why he can judge people and why he can reward them. The next part, man, I don't know about you. I'd rather be a part of this last section here. Look at this. After judgment, he says, next part. Uh, now, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, those to you who do not hold to her teaching have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. See, not all of them fell for this. It's like, those that fell for it, I gave you time, and you didn't change, so this is going to be bad. But those who didn't fall for it, right? I will not impose any burden, any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have till I come. In your Bible, there may be quotes around that last phrase. You know why that's there? I didn't. I had to look it up. Uh, it's actually a reference back to Acts chapter 15. We just did this whole series on Acts late last year. And as you might remember, in Acts 15, the early church is faced with this big question. Basically, do you have to become Jewish before you can become a Christian, right? <clears throat> do you have to get circumcised, follow all the diet laws, all that stuff, before you can follow Jesus, since Jesus was Jewish, came out of Judaism. Some people were saying, yes, you have to be Jewish first, then you can be Christian, and freaking out some new Christians in the church. So the leaders of the church met together, and long story short, they end up sending this letter. Check it out. They say, the apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings, says, we've heard someone out from us, and without our authorization disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's, here's the reference here. Therefore, we're sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. Look at this yellow part. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. And the letter goes on. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, from sexual immorality. You'll do well to avoid these things. Farewell. But that yellow part, that's what Jesus is referring to in this part in Revelation when he says, I will impose no other burden on you. That was the idea there. And his point was exactly that, that these Christians who've been resisting that false teaching, right, and resisting that secret knowledge garbage, he goes, great job, keep doing that. Keep persevering, continue standing firm, hang on to that non-compromising standard. And you might say, how long? He goes, till the end, right? Until you, till someday you die or Jesus comes back, you keep doing that to the end. Don't ever stop. If you do, look what Jesus says in verse 26. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, circle, underline, highlight, to the end. You do that, I'll give authority over the nations. Whoa. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Those are references to Old Testament prophecies like you find in Psalm 2, 9, Isaiah 30, 14, Jeremiah 19, 11. We put a bunch list on the bottom there so you don't have to try to jot them all down. But it's basically this idea that Jesus is going to grant them a share in his kingdom. Whoa. Can we live with an eternal perspective? Put yourself in their shoes. 
I'm on this earth for maybe this long. And then eternity starts and goes on forever. And this long right now, it's hard. I'm trying to make a living. My job is requiring me to disobey Jesus, to worship other gods, to do stuff Jesus wouldn't like. And it's hard. And he gets that. He goes, but here's the thing. It's only this long. If you can make it from here to here, from there till forever, you will have a reward that nothing can take away. Keep an eternal perspective. How stupid would it be to waste this little bit and ruin that? How stupid would it be to give up on Jesus in this little bit and ruin that? Just because of a little pressure? I think it was last week or maybe it was Wednesday I shared. You know, I love to do these crazy workouts. Obviously, you can tell. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, I love to do these crazy beach body workouts. And this one workout I absolutely hate uh, called plyometrics. And uh, some of you know what that is, like jump training. And, and I don't like that workout, but I do it anyway when I'm doing the program. But there's this great part where the trainer on the video, he goes, you know, it's only 30 seconds. You can do anything for 30 seconds. And you're like, uh -huh, you know, and you try it anyway. But I think of that in terms of Christianity so often. Oh, life is so hard right now. Yeah, but you can do anything for 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Life on this earth is just 30 seconds compared to eternity. He goes, can you hang in there with Jesus for 30 seconds? It'll last forever if you do right? Give you a share in his kingdom. They'll receive rule with him in the end. Just as I have received authority from my father, he says. I will also give that one the morning star, Jesus says. That's an image from places like Numbers 24, 15 through 19, which is actually coming up if you guys are doing the, the challenge, but that's coming up pretty soon. Uh, but it's most likely a reference to the idea Jesus is the ruler of everything, right? And he's basically reaffirming that huge promise he just made. Then verse 29, as he often also ends these letters, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, will you listen to what I just said? Will you not dismiss it and go, oh, that's nice, what's for lunch? Will you listen, will you hear what I just said? Which brings up the biggest question for us today, right? Will we listen <laughs> and learn from what he said to this church back then? When we are faced with the pressure to compromise on Jesus somehow at our jobs especially, when it threatens our income, just compromise a little. Don't take Jesus so serious. Don't put him first, or you might not make it money-wise. When that temptation comes, how do we respond? Will we remember what Jesus says in this letter? Do we stand firm and believe? You know what? I believe you, Jesus. You said if I put you first, you'll take care of me. So I'm just going to put you first, and, and, and you will. And Amy and I have journals filled with examples of how God does that. But we don't see that when we try to control it ourselves. Right, some, some bill comes up we weren't expecting or, you know, someone hits our car. It's happened twice since we've had it. It hasn't even, hasn't even been here yet. Um, have to pay for repairs and then the insurance takes forever to come through. And, oh, you have a deductible. And they have ah, those little moments. I, oh, no, I better work more, God, but I won't have as much time for church. Yeah, I can do that and wear myself out and freak out and have less time with him and less time with my family. Or I can go, God, what are you going to do? <laughs> we need your help. And I'll tell you, it is, gosh, I've lost count how many times this past year. Uh, Amy, after she graduated, left her job she had while she was in college, got one job. That one didn't work out, went to another job. We get these random things in the mail. Oh, you had some retirement money that that's, uh, you never pulled out. Do you want it? Yeah. It just happens to be enough and in time for this bill? Sure. Right? And that's, wow, God, that was cool. A few months later, happened again with a different, hey, you had some retirement money. Did you want this? Okay, God, you know, oh my goodness. Some of you guys know I paint paintings. I had this, some of you have been to our apartment, I had this series of the days of creation. Somebody saw those and wanted them a long time ago and never got back to me. And then this week was like, hey, are those still for sale? Oh, sure, how much you want for them? I told them they gave me $1,000 more than that. I was like, okay, you know. Guys, God is so good. He takes care of you if you trust him. But you never see that if you keep trying to do it yourself. You've got to put him first. He says, put me first, and everything you need will be taken care of. Matthew 6, right? Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and everything you need will be taken care of. Now, it's not an excuse to be a lazy bum. He still wants you to work. But when those emergencies come up, when things get tough, where do you go? Do you compromise? Do you look for someone to tell you what you want to hear? Or do you go, no, I'm standing firm for, I'm trusting you, Jesus. And those are the questions for today for our chat time. Check this out. Question number one. Have you ever had a time when you had to choose between following Jesus and doing what your employer wanted, right? And if so, what did you choose? And be honest. I mean, we're family here. Be honest. Number two, did you, do you tend to seek Jesus during tough times? Things get tough. The pressure comes up. What do you do? Do you run to him? Or do you try to find a way to kind of compromise? And maybe even seek out a teacher who will tell you what you want to hear. Find a book who will tell you what you want to hear. Jesus says, the Bible says, as the end nears, more and more people are going to do that. They'll actually... 
gather around them people that tell them what their itching ears want to hear, but it's not what God wants, right? It's not a good thing. Number three, so how can you stand firm for Jesus next time you're tempted, right? One of the greatest things you can get out of the New Testament is Jesus is far more concerned about your future than your past, right? He tells these guys, I gave him a chance to change, they didn't, right? You think of Peter, he blows it, denies Jesus three times. When Jesus meets up with him afterwards, he doesn't bring up the past. He goes, do you, do you love me now? Because I have future stuff for you to do, right? Regardless of whatever led up to just now, from here on, what will you do? That's what he wants to know. What can you do this week when you're tempted to compromise out of fear? Some big questions, but some very relevant ones from this chapter in Revelation. Let's take about 10 minutes to talk about those with the people around you. If you're sitting off by yourself, just maybe find someone else to sit with and, and chat with them. And then as always, pray for each other. And today I want to challenge you, pray specifically about this stuff. Because we all have jobs, we all have school, we're all going to be tempted this week to deny Jesus in some way and put something else first. We're going to be tempted this week to listen to that voice inside our head or that teacher on TV or in that book that says, oh no, it's fine, you can have Jesus and that. Well, we stand for and pray for each other, Okay. Big questions, pray for each other, and we will close it up in about 10 minutes. Ready, set, discuss.